Hello and welcome to the Empire's first podcast of the 2016-17 season. I'm Benjamin Simon. And I'm Warren Barry. And today we'll be covering the um, six teams of the City Six. And uh, we'll be talking about the different ways and, you know, how things have gone during the season and what we should be expecting going forward from the teams. Uh, multiple different topics. We have a lot of interesting facts and a lot of interesting topics to bring up about these teams. And it's just going to be straight talking Philly, Philly college basketball. And I'm really excited to uh, get talking. I know you are too, Will. Um, so uh, why don't we get started with um, Drexel and um, – you know, this season, it's been an up-and-down season for Jacksonville. They're 9-20 and 20 as of right now, 3-13 and 13 in conference play, ranked uh, 10th in the CAA. <clears throat> and, but it's also been a pretty good year. I mean, coming off a 6-25 and 25 year last year, they fired their uh, head coach in the offseason, Bruiser Flint, hired Zach Spiker. Um, they lost six players last year, including four of their top six scorers. And they've already surpassed their win total from last year, despite the fact that they lost so many guys from last year. You know, Will, well, first of all, do you think this season has been a success? I mean, they're 9-20. and 20. Um, if, if so, why? If, if, if you don't think it's been a success, why, why not? You know, all things considered, I would say that this year has been a, been a success. You look at it from Spiker's point of view. It's his first year with the group. He brought in a few recruits. He has... He has a few players left over from when Flint was the coach with Rodney Williams and Muhammad Ba and Sam Mojica, just to name a few players. And I would say that the record doesn't really show what the team's been like this year. They have lost a a couple of really tight games, uh, one against Towson a few weeks ago. And I would say that so far in conference play, of course, they've only won three games, but they've been in every game. One thing that I've noticed with them this season is they've been able to force teams to score more than last year, mm-hmm. which is an, uh, uh, a compliment to Spiker because if you think about it, Drexel last year, they were being outscored and they just weren't, they didn't have the offense they needed because they had lost, um, they had lost Sean London, they had lost... Um, Damian Lee, they lost Damian Lee. They had lost Damian Lee. So I think that this year, being able to force teams to score... 70 plus points every night just to, you know, beat Drexel. I think that would uh, be a uh, coin to success. Yeah, I think that. Um, I think it, it's. I think it. I think the season definitely has been a success, and I think uh, part of the reason it's been a success is the emergence of some big contributors that are going to be big contributors, you know, for the next couple of years, um, and that's Kirk Lee, Kari Johnson, and Austin Williams in particular. Um, we knew Sammy Mojica could score. We knew he could shoot. Um, we've seen him do it in the past. Obviously, we'd like him to be a little more consistent, but I feel like he's been more consistent this year, honestly, than he has been in the year past. He's been stabilizing. He's, average, he's averaging almost six rebounds, which is something you know you haven't seen from him in the past. And but Kirk Lee, Johnson, and Williams are you know who? I mean, I didn't see Austin Williams coming out and playing the way he's he's played this season. I mean, he's been averaging. 22 minutes per game, 7 points per game, 6.6 rebounds. He's averaging a block, and he's shooting 61% from the field. And it's not like he's just getting, like, easy putbacks. or He's working. He's got a nice little right-handed baby hook. And I think that they have the pieces. And one thing that you notice is is that Zach Spiker has brought a certain energy that um, that they haven't had in years past. And, like, you never see Zach Spiker stop stop clapping on the sidelines he's always clapping regardless of what happens if they turn the ball over it's it's okay and we got the next one and and I think that's really rubbed off on a lot of these guys and you can tell how much they care I mean you've seen Kirk Lee after he turns the ball over and one turnover it could be his only turnover of the game and he is beating himself up about it and he cares so much you can tell how much these guys care and I can't say that I've seen them play this year and that they've given well I mean I I can't say that I haven't seen them play hard this year. There has not been a game this year where I haven't seen them play hard. And I think that that shows a lot about their team. And I I think that, I mean, you talked about how, um, you know, they're forcing teams to score a lot, uh, you know, and they might be allowing teams to score a lot. uh, And, like, they defensively is where they've gone. They've struggled. I mean, they have some really, really good offensive players, and they have all the pieces offensively. 
They've given they've had 14 game they've given up in 14 games this year they've given up 80 or more points, which is just I mean almost half the games that they've given up more than 80 points and they've given up two, two with over 100. Um, granted, they scored 100. Po- I mean, they scored 100 points in one of those two games, which is a lot. But you know, defense is, I think, obviously where you know they're going to need to improve. Definitely, I you know going back to what you were saying about the energy that Spiker has brought and how all the players have you know they haven't held their heads down even though the season hasn't been you know a huge success. Of course, they play better than they did last year. But one thing I have to say about everyone is that they bought in. They bought in the Spiker system. Mm -hmm. They have followed his lead. And you can see that with, you know, Kirk Lee and Corey Johnson and um, everyone up and down the bench. They've all bought into the system, and they've been able to compete every night. Yeah. I mean, you even got guys like uh, Sam Green and Jeremy Peck that haven't gotten off the bench that are freshmen that have gotten off at some points from the season that they've shown that they can, you know, produce at certain points. I mean, Jeremy Peck was all state in high school. Like, th- this is – I think we could look back and say this, especially considering the fact that this was his first year, this, Spiker did a fantastic job with this recruiting class. Um, and I think we could look back and say, like, this recruiting class could be really, really, really good. Um, and, and I think that – I think that this – I mean, you got Major Kennedy coming back right now. You haven't had all the pieces. Um, and Muhammad Bob missed some games. Uh, Miles Overton's out now. And he – and Miles Overton never got it going um, offensively. No, I would say that he never played as consistent as he thought he would when he would transfer from his big fours. But he did have a stretch there where he – I think it was five or six games he had four in double figures. I think he did, you know – at moments, he had his moments this year, but no, he wasn't as consistent as we all thought he would be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he had he got it. He played better towards the end of the season. Um, had a really good game against Penn. Um, hit five threes. We went and saw that game. That was his season high with nineteen. Um, maybe his maybe even his career high. I'm not sure, but definitely a season high. And I mean, we see the building blocks, and I think that this year was a success. And we haven't even talked about the guy. I mean, that's Rodney Williams. Rodney Williams has been really, really good this year. And, and a lot of times he he's asked to cover the other team's best guards. I mean, when they played um, – when Drexel played LaSalle, he was asked to cover B.J. Johnson. Um, they held B.J. Johnson to 12 points, which is was his third lowest scoring out of them in the year. Um, uh, granted, that was one of Rodney Williams' worst offensive games all year, but you – they the Spiker's asking um a lot from these guys. He's asking Rodney Williams to cover. He asked him to cover Matt McDonald Matt McDonald against um Penn and Ryan Beatley who's been playing great recently. Um th- you know, Rodney Williams has been the M V P of this team without a doubt. He's a, he's covering the best team's wings or big men. He's been able to score off the dribble and in the post. He's gotten to the line. He's had hundred and seventy nine free throw attempts this year, which is 50 more than any other player in the City Six. The second is Josh Hart. Um, and just tell you how much he's bad on how much he's meant to this team. And um, I think he's been great this year. I wouldn't be surprised if they could make a maybe a little bit of a run in the CAA. This is the kind of team that plays hard all the time. The CAA conference tournament. This is a team that plays hard all the time. And I could see them catching fire at the right moment. Same here. Um, with Drexel, you know, I feel like any on any given day, as long as they're making their shots, especially their three pointers, they can compete with any team in their conference. Without a doubt. I mean, obviously, like UNC Wilmington is a uh, is a step ahead of a lot of the. Other, I mean, other teams. I mean, they're twenty four and five, um, and you know they they got Elon. Uh, no, I'm sorry. They got James Madison coming up, and the College of Charleston. College of Charleston's 21 and 8 this year, so that's going to be a tough matchup. And James Madison is 8 and 8 and 21 this year. Um, so I mean, hopefully they can get a win over James Madison next next game, and then again, and then a win against the College of Charleston, who's at the top of the um, conference, would be a great win, and I think would show a lot about where the program's headed. And I think it is headed in the right direction, for, without a doubt. Yeah. And 
I mean, I, I think that Kirk Lee is the real deal. Um, he's got like a real ability to finish around the rim, even despite his size, and finish in the mid range. He loves the mid range shot, and he's just so quick. And he knows when to pull up, and he knows when to shoot the floater, and he knows how to he knows how to get, uh, score the basketball without always having to go to the big man. And that's one of the things someone his height has to understand. And he's done a great job of understanding that for someone of his age and his experience level. And that's, I think that's what's going to help him down the line is that Kirk Lee is not afraid to work on his game. He's not the one who's going to, you know, slack off just because he's had to be a freshman year. You know, we all the time you'll see Kirk Lee posting videos on his Twitter page or just the way he t- just his presence on the floor, even off the floor, uh, encouraging his teammates. He's the one who wants to continuously get better. So what we're seeing from him now is just uh, the small sample size of what we may see in three years when he's a senior and possibly one of the best players in the city six. Yeah, him and Kari Johnson, the dynamic duo. They're going to be really good together. It's going to be a very scary backcourt. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, do you have anything else to add about Drexel? I would just, you know, I know you brought up uh, Austin Williams in the season he was having. And, you know, with Williams, he's not the one who has to have plays drawn up for him. He's the one who is just going to, you know, work hard on the glass and continuously set, uh, set picks for his teammates. And I really been, I really, I've really been impressed with how he's played this year. And, you know, after last year not being so much of a, a vocal point in the team, coming back this season, um, his junior year and stepping up in a big way and uh, uh, giving Drexel another big man to pair with Rodney Williams. Yeah, and he's a legit contributor these next couple of years, don't you think? Yeah, I would say I would say so. You know, one thing that I think Drexel can work on for next season, I know I don't want to jump ahead because they still have conference play, but I think if they have that, you know, another big man they can pair with uh, Williams, I know they're Jeremy adding, Peck. Uh, well, Jeremy Peck, yes. And then they're also adding uh, Jarvis Knoll, uh, 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 college prep, uh, college prep transfer next year. So I just think that you know if they can add one more big man, possibly Tony Peck Miles. or uh, maybe Tasha Miles. But you know, I think that Austin Williams is going to help them next year be that you know senior big man who can you know play defense and every once in a while give you a maybe a eight to ten footer from paint. Yeah, and he's got a really good right and left baby hook. I mean, I noticed that um, in the games that I've been to is that he's he's actually a good scorer and that, like, I think if he were given a – like, he's, he's a good scorer and that, like, he's going to – I think he's legit starter in the CIA. And they're going to miss Rodney Williams a lot. You know, Rodney Williams is – he's not just a good scorer. He's a good passer. He opens up a lot for Kirkley and Kari Johnson to hit those shots. And Sammy Mojica and Miles Overton when he was healthy, um, and John Moran, Moran. But um, I think Austin Williams can can score down low for them next year, in a role that they're going to need some scoring down low. You know that's what Jexel Jexel basketballs. You know for the past couple of years uh, has they've had some pretty good bigs um, with Kazembe Abith and you know Rodney Williams at this point. And yeah, but I mean, if you don't have anything else to add, we can get moving on to St. Joe's. Sure. Um, so St. Joe's, uh, they're currently ten and sixteen, three and eleven in conference, tied for twelfth in the conference. But that doesn't speak to what's happened this season. Ten and sixteen is not representative of the record. Wouldn't you agree, Will? I would agree. Um, from the beginning of the season, St. Joe's was behind the eight ball. Of course, behind the eight ball. Of course, before the season started, they lost Checo Oliva to a chronic knee issue, so he was unable to play this season. And then right before the new year, Shabar Newkirk tore his ACL, and he was done for the year and had to get surgery. And then just when you thought matters couldn't get worse, Lamar Kimmel goes down just when he had to step up for Newkirk. So I just think that St. Joe's is tried to find ways to compete even with their core players like Newkirk and Kimball and Oliva. And then for a time, they also lost James Simply for a 10-game absence because he got hurt for his game against Toledo. So I think that with this year with Phil Martelli, he's tried to 
know, control the damage that's been done by injuries that flee at the roster. But the record is 10 and 16, and Marcelli will be the first one to tell you that, you know, you are what your record says you are. But I think that the fight that uh, players like Brendan Casper and James Demery and uh, Javon Bowman and Nick Robinson and Charlie Brown, who are just new to the team, but the fight that they've shown is going to they go uh, down the down the road. Mm-hmm. I know last year, you know, expectations have been set high because of how they played in the past. Like last year when they had Yonke Yonke Bembry and mm-hmm. Aaron Brown and Isaiah Miles, and you know, coming into this year, they knew that there was going to be a slight drop off, maybe maybe more than a slight drop off, but you know, no one could have, could have expected the amount of injuries they suffered this year. Yeah, and it's a shame because I don't think anyone expected either how good Shavar Newkirk was. And how I mean, he was really good. He averaged twenty point three points per game, um, and he was just really crafty. And I don't think anyone expected him to take on the role of scoring as well as he did. And and you know, Lamar Kimball, um, I thought I thought he showed flashes of potential. And I think he was really good when he was paired side by side with Newkirk. I thought he struggled more when he when he had to do um, more by himself, and and it's a shame because you know Newkirk and and Kimball were really good together, but we didn't get to see Newkirk, Kimball, and Demery together, which was what we were excited to see. I mean, we saw in the first game when they beat a pretty solid Toledo team, and um, you know we it's I think it's 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 unfortunate. Um, especially since, like, you know, you're not going to probably get a red shirt for Newkirk, and you're definitely not going to get a red shirt for Kimball. So it's kind of like, it's you know, I don't want to say it's a wasted year, but it kind of feels that way. But, you know, the great thing is that you're getting a lot of experience for guys like Charlie Brown, Nick Robinson, Chris Clover, um, four guys that are going to have to play a lot of minutes these next couple of years. And Charlie Brown, I mean, from day one was a starter, and there have been high expectations for how successful he'd be, and he has um, played much better recently. He was named A-10 Rookie of the Week last week. He's shooting 39% from uh, three, 20 games in double digits, 12 points per game, 5.2 rebounds, um, and it, it's been really impressive how well uh, he's played these last couple games uh, when it's kind of the team is revolving around him basically to score. I mean, James Demery's primarily uh, defensive purposes, but um, you know, in the last couple games, he's had the you know the last single digit game he had was uh, February. I mean, uh, January seventh, so less than more than a month ago was his last single digit game when he scored zero points against Fordham, and since then he hasn't had less than eleven points, um, and he's had. Uh, one twenty point game, one twenty two point game against Fordham in a double the overtime loss, multiple, multiple three point game, three point make games. Um, and and the other thing is he's getting rebounds. I mean he hasn't had the game, many games this year where he's had less than five rebounds. And he's getting consistently getting rebounds. He's going and fighting. You can't question his heart. Um, and Nick Robinson, um hasn't been as productive as I think probably as someone would like on the offensive end. What do you think? No, I agree. I think Robinson, I know the time that we went to go see them against George Washington, he had a few a few solid drives, but I think with him is he's kind of going through with, with uh, going through what freshmen, normal freshmen do. Chris Clover kind of went through it last year. Is when they're kind of they're second-guessing themselves. They know that they can do it, but I just think that he's you know, one step behind the game. and I think that what he's learning right now through this season is that he just has to go. He can't second guess himself. He just has to attack the basket and, you know, play the way he played in high school to get to this level. So I think Robinson hasn't performed as performed like he thought he would, uh, but he's he's learning as as the season goes on. Yeah, and Chris Clover has surprised some people in these last couple of games. Yeah, I mean I think Clover he's you know, he had, you know, I think one game he had over twenty points for a high and he's been able to that he's not, you know, the primary scorer. That's, you know, that's more so Charlie Brown. But I think Clover's been a he's found a way to kind of impact the team in a in a small role. Sometimes, you know, he's been he's um 
to be able to come up, come off, come off the bench or announce and both uh, Kirk and Kimball are both out with injury. He's been able to start and hit a few shots here and there. So I think he's doing much better than he did last year. And I expect, you know, him to take another jump next year. Yeah, well, this is great confidence booster for him. I mean, this is a guy who was, I'm pretty sure, is the MVP of the Catholic League in Philly. And just the last two years, he just looks like he just is, I mean, he just looks like he's he's got a lot of butterflies and he's just nervous. And he has not played that way these last couple of weeks. 21 points against VCU, 21 against LaSalle. He had 13 last night against LaSalle in their second meeting, 21 in their first meeting. And you're hoping that this helps get him gain some confidence going into next season. I know you don't want to think about next season, um, but it's just been such a tough season. And, and a guy that we haven't really talked about who has really provided a lot of leadership and, like, a lot of minutes at this point is, is Brandon Casper. Yeah, I read a really good article about Casper on com, And, you know, one thing that a lot of people forget uh, about what St. Joe's previously is that, you know, this year, of course, they're not doing as well, but in past years, and Casper's freshman and junior year, they won an A-10 championships. Mm-hmm. So he knows what it takes to win, and he is the ultimate team guy. You know, he's not the one he knew coming into the St. Joe's program four years ago that he wasn't going to be their main player, but, you know, he was able to gel with, uh, at the time, uh, Bembry was a, a, a younger player on the team, so he's able to gel with some of the younger players like DeAndre Bembry, he was always able to practice really hard in practice. I know Phil Martelli had talked about how sometimes he didn't know how practice was going to end because Casper and Bembry would go so hard at each other. But at the end of the day, they were brothers, and they just wanted to make each other better. So I think Casper has really um, acknowledged and accepted that role of being someone to push people in practice, and now is is uh, benefiting from what he did when he was a uh, underclassman, and now being one of the leaders on this year's team. Yeah, and what do you think? What do you think about what? What do you think their goals are heading forward, St. Joe's? What, what would be your goals if you were the coach? Is everybody healthy? Um, I know that you know easy uh, cop out answer a little bit, but I think that if they get Oliva, uh, Newkirk, and Kimmel back, and Emory will be a senior, I know that they'll lose Javon Bauman and they'll lose Brennan Casper. But, it, but the entire uh, the rest of the roster will be back and a little bit older, and I know that they have some recruits coming in. So my plan going forward would be to get everyone healthy and try to find someone else to – I think they need another point guard. Um, of course, they have Kemble and Newkirk, but then see what happened this year. Once you lose both – once those guys either – I mean, for next year, say if one of them needs a blow, who, who else can handle the locker in St. Joe's? Mm. I know now they're using Brendan Casper and Nick Robinson at point guard, but you know either uh, Nick Robinson used to spend this summer working on his handles and trying to become a point guard. Which is I don't know if that's something that I tell thinking about, but I think they need either someone who's currently on the roster to step up as being a third option at point guard because most likely going forward, Kimball and Newkirk will both be on the floor at the same time, so I think they'll need another ball handler. And, you know, if they don't have that, then it's fine just resting either Newkirk or Kimball and then leaving the other one in the game. So, okay, moving forward, they need to show up their backcourt. And then with the front court, um, I think that Marquette Lodge is solid for what they need right now. He can keep it for present. You know, we would hope that next year that he could add some type of uh, game around the basket. But, for, you know, for what St. Joe's needs, I think he would be fine pairing with Checo in the front quarter and just yeah, providing a rim protector. Yeah, and I agree with you about they need a, a point card. I mean, what what do you think that their goals are, like, for the rest of the season? Like, how do you – yeah. I would say it would, it, would, it would be the same thing. I mean, that, you know, these past couple of games, um, you know, the one thing that we'll all say is that, oh, they just they didn't win because they didn't two best players. But I think if Emory and Robinson and the, entire, the entirety of the roster, if they go out there and compete, they play for 40 minutes, you can't, you can't ask for anything else. It may not end the way they want to, but I think the goals for the rest of the season are to compete, and then once they get into the conference play, they like it's your last game. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I, I think – I mean, James Demery <clears throat> is one of the best defenders in the A-10. Um, I mean, 
He's not an offensive superstar, and we're paying attention to the offensive super, superstars here with their loss to Newkirk. But, like, they have a legit lockdown defender. Um, and that's something that uh, <clears throat> you got to, you know, play around that defense now, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a little upsetting because if everyone was healthy, Emory would have to really rely. He wouldn't really have to worry about offense. He could just be the defender that he is, and then the offense would just come naturally. He would have to, you know, say to himself before games, oh, I have to score because, you know, our top players are out. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have anything else to add about St. Joe's? No, just that I'm really – I'm interested. I know that, you know, going in at – Basically, for the rest of the season, it doesn't look very promising, but I wouldn't be surprised if they shock us all in the first round of A-10 play. Yeah, I, you know, this team's going to play with a chip on their shoulder, that's for sure. And, you know, yeah, um, so <laughs> let, let's move on to Penn, and um, Penn is 11-12 right now. They're riding a four-game win streak uh, with some really good wins, most recently against Yale, who's at the top of the conf- who's at one of the top teams in the conference. Uh, 71-55 win this weekend. And they have just – everything is clicking for them. They're 4-6 and six in conference, currently fifth in the Ivy. They are knocking on the door of the playoff picture. And honestly, there's not a team – there's not a team in the Ivy League that probably wants to face Penn right now. That's how well they're playing. Penn has a hot hand right now. Um, of course, I know you mentioned earlier in the podcast, Ryan, but, uh, it, it is, it is. but I mean, their entire roster, I know throughout the season, Darnell Foreman has always been able to rely a stable, has been consistent for them on the offensive of end and been, you know, their, their point guard. But right now, Penn has the hot hand, and the Ivy League, he, they put the Ivy League on notice. Yeah, and, you know, you, you got to ask, like, what, what, what went right for Penn? Because for so long, it was not nowhere near um, the expectations that a lot of fans had for them. Um, they lost four games in a row, and then I think they won a game and lost three more games in a row. So they lost seven out of eight games for at one point. Um, and then they went on this win streak. And, I mean, I, I have some ideas of what went right. But, you know, first is Ryan Beatley named, you know, he's the name, named co-Ivy League Player of the Week co-Big Five Player of the Week, Rookie of the Week, I'm sorry. Uh, he was named the co-Ivy Rookie of the Week and co-Big Five Rookie Player of the Week. Um, he's played great um, recently, and he's given them a spark offensively that they've needed. And the thing that all te- Coach Donahue's teams want to do is shoot threes. And um, Ryan Beatley has done that. There's no doubt about that. Uh He's shooting 41% from three, which is fantastic. 49% from the field. He's been majorly efficient offensively. Um, he was sidelined to start the season, but a 22-point game against Cornell uh, last Sunday, 5 of 10 from three, scored 28 against Brown um, with 6 of 10 from three, both wins. And you can just see there's 7 and 6 in games that he's played this year. And the other guy that's set in that – you know, has played a big role in their success recently is Devin Goodman. You look at the, you know, score, you know, like statistics, and you'll see Devin, Devin Bo- Goodman's at the bottom. Uh, three points per game, nothing special. But you have to look at how well the team has played with him in the game. There's seven and two in games where he's played ten or more minutes. Well, he is um, was the MVP of the Interact last year in high school. He is small. He's, he's small, but he's smart. He's a, he's a fine shooter. He's quick. And one of the quickest guys probably in the Ivy League. And and he just plays good basketball. And you can tell he's got chemistry with Beatley. He's got chemistry with these all these guys. And they're playing hard for him. Um, and, you know, Jackson Donahue played well finally the other day. Had a 20-point game. And Darnell Foreman has uh, taken over the point guard role. And it's, I think we all expected this, uh, was that you you have to expect the unexpected from Coach Donahue's lineups. And that... He's going to play who he thinks deserves to play. He's not going to play based off stats last year, based off stats from high school. You have to earn it when you get there. And you see guys like Caleb Wood get pushed to the bench after they started this year. Jake Silpy, after playing so many minutes last year, is not playing. Um, Jackson Donnie, who had a little stretch where he had a, he logged a DNP and played one minute against Harvard. and And it's working this year. And you see, you see what's you know going on here. What do you think about their success and what's going right for them? 
Well, you're exactly what you were saying. I agree. I think that with Coach Donahue, like you said, you have to expect the unexpected. I know uh, one player who, you know, surprisingly had a really good game recently was Sam Jones. Yeah. He came in and had a lot of threes and helped them win that game. So I feel like with Penn, one thing that's really – you have to show up to every game because you really don't know who's going to help them win that night. Mm-hmm. So I think that with Coach Donahue and with the system that he has there, he keeps all his players on the toe on his on their toes. Um, with AJ Brodeur, he had a, a Broder, he had an amazing start to the season. And he's still playing well, but even him, he, sometimes he's had off nights where someone else has had to step up. So one thing that with Penn that I think is going to really help them during the Ivy League play is that they have so many options off the bench and even in their starting lineup. I mean, we haven't even talked about Matt Howard. It's his senior year. Yeah, <laughs> Matt Howard's played great. Um, and he's, he's played, just he's so played. versatile. He means so much to this team. And I mean, Howard, he just he just does so much on the defensive end. He helps them on offense. He's, I couldn't when I realized when I was you know uh, watching him recently. I realized, oh man, this is Matt Howard's last season. He's playing one of his you know, a couple of his last Ivy League games in his career. So mm-hmm. I know he's ready to see and you know primed for a really good end of the year. Yeah, and he's averaging almost 12 points per game, seven rebounds. He's asked often to cover the other team's four, despite being six four. Um, so he has a tall order every time, every day. And he's had um, 16 double digit games, four double doubles. He's shooting 49 percent from the field well. But we haven't even talked about their guy, and that's AJ Broder. Um, and AJ Broder has been amazing. He's been fantastic. 14 points per game, seven rebounds and 2.1 assists per game. And I don't think a lot of people comprehend how important that is, um, especially to Steve Donahue's teams. You remember Darian Nelson, that, Darian Nelson Henry last year? Um, one of the best things that he did was pass the ball to the post, and that got open jump shots for other players. And that's what you need in a Steve Donahue offense is, a, is a, well, first of all, a big man who plays the interior, um, takes up space to open up opportunities for those big men, I mean, for those shooters. Um, and... Uh, we're seeing that with A.J. Um, Broder is able to, as a freshman, step in and be one of the best players in the Ivy League without a doubt. Uh, and one of the reasons is he's been so vital to the team is he's averaging 2.1 assists per game. Gives him an assist, assist percentage of 16.1%, which is 14th in the Ivy League and second as a big man behind Cornell Stone Gettings. And it just tells you a lot about, like, like he's a, OJ, A.J. Broder is a really good passer. And, um, and, and that plays a huge role in their success. Uh, he's shooting 46% from three, 53% from the field. He's had three double doubles, 16 double digit scoring games. And he's been, I think the reason why they've been so good, his ability to pass, especially get those open shots for guys like Sam Jones, Jackson Donahue, Ryan Beatley now. Um, Matt Howard, who's improved his three-point shooting. And I think he's, you know, undoubtedly been the best player on the team. We can't forget about him on defense. I know that, you know, he may not – he always gets credit for his offensive game, but he, he gives them so much in defense again. He always is there to cover the one if they lose their – if they lose if they lose their man or, he, you know, he's there to protect the rim. So I think that he does so much for the team, not only on the offensive again, but also on defense. Yeah, and if you look at the the three game, their four game losing streak back in January, and their four game winning streak now, they're shooting thirty nine percent from three in this four game winning streak now, which is a great number as a team. Um, uh, for a team that want to hit th- wants to hit threes, they shot twenty seven percent from three over that four game losing streak in January, and that tells you a lot about when this team is successful and when they're not, and they're successful when they hit threes. And Ryan Beatley's giving that to them. And it, it kind of pushes like guys like Jake Silpy, who have struggled in the past shooting threes, to the to the wayside. And D- John, Donahue's going to play the people who produce and who play, who are playing well. And he's not going to play you based on past experiences. Um, you saw Jackson Donahue, man. He got in the doghouse early this season, despite such a great season last year. And... He's back. He's back because he's producing in practice, probably, and definitely in the games now to earn minutes again. Um, yeah. Do you have anything else to add? Oh, 
Um, and and Darnell, we haven't even talked about Darnell, but the team is uh, eight and four in games when he has four four more assists, and that just tells you about sharing the ball and how important it is to the team. We talked about with AJ, AJ Broder, how it gets three point shooters open, and Darnell's been great at that. He's been very consistent and stepped in, and he's playing defense. Always plays defense on the other team's the best opposing guards, and that's really important because there are a lot of good guards in um, the Ivy League, you know, down from Siani Chambers, um, you know, to to guy like Steven Spieth. He might be a little big for uh, um, Darnell, but it's just a lot of good uh, guards and forwards in the Ivy League. And Darnell often nights, nice, because of his length, might have to stick a guy if – like Steven Spieth, if uh, if Matt Howard might be in foul trouble, Matt McDonald's not playing, um, so it's it's impressive how well they played recently, and I think it's definitely a credit to their shooting ability. Um, but let let's get um, let's get moving on to Temple. Uh, well, what can you tell us about Temple? Well, they lost a heartbreaker last night. Yeah. Uh, I know you were at the game, and uh, they lost on a game-winning shot in the last uh, last five or so seconds, but well, this year, they are currently 14 and 14. They're 5 and 10 in conference, 8th eight, eight in the American Athletic Conference. And, you know, I think that they've had an up and down season. I know, you know, Temple's known for winning games they're not supposed to and losing ones they're supposed to, which is just something that, you know, seems, <laughs> seems to happen to them. It's the, but, it's you know, the Temple way. It's just the Temple way. But one thing, but I've been really impressed by Shiz Austin this year. Um, his reduction, I mean, last year he he had an okay year last year, but this year he really stepped up for them, averaging 13.6 points per game, um, almost four rebounds. And he had a three-game a three, a three game stretch where he um, was, he scored in double, double figures um, in three consecutive games. And what I like to uh, talk about with Shiz is, you know, past guards like Will Cummings and Khalif White and Juan Fernandez, they all did it have a great freshman year, but then, you know, their sophomore or senior year, they really showed up and became that guard for a friend that these teams. So I think Shiz is following, following in their footsteps and becoming the guys that Temple needs them to be. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I, I think Shiz has played much better as the year goes on. There's something that I knew from the first minute I saw Shiz Austin play um, was that he was tough and that he was tough as nails. I saw it back in uh, Annapolis, when they played North Carolina last year in his first game, first possession down the floor gets pickpocketed by Joel Barry um, of North Carolina. Next possession goes right back at Joel Barry and scores a bucket. And that just shows his fearlessness. And you see it every single game with Shiz Austin. He's fearless. He's not going to give up. He is going to fight, and he cares so much about being successful. I, if there was one thing that I had to critique him about, it would be the fact that I feel like he shoots – well, I know he shoots a lot of contested threes, a lot of contested jump shots. Um, he's a very, very good shooter. I, and I think sometimes the ball gets stopped in his hands and he gets in his own little zone where he tries to go one-on-one and chuck up like a step back three or a three with the hand in his face. And when he's hot, it goes in, but he's not hot every game, actually. And uh, it, that frustrates me about him. And, and this thing about this Temple team is that they just uh, – they're just not very cohesive, especially down the stretch offensively. And you've just seen so many times this year when the game's on the line, they just can't seem to figure out a way to 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 finish it. And I think part of it is cohesiveness. They in the past years there hasn't been a year where they haven't had a go to guy at the end of the game or at the end of the shot clock to get him a bucket. Um the one year where they didn't have a legit guy to put the ball in the hands was um, junior uh, was Will, Will Cummings' junior year, um, Dalton Pepper's senior year, um, where they really struggled and they missed the N- NIT NCAA tournament. Um, and that was because Will Cummings hadn't developed yet. They didn't have a star. Yet. And the next year, Will Cummings would be that star, and they made it to the NIT. Uh, and obviously, the NIT isn't like, you know, where Temple wants to be, but it's better than not making any tournament. Um and I think that you look at these past teams with Khalif and Will Cummings and Deontay Christmas, if we're going back that far, and most recently Quentin DeCozy, they always had a guy they could they could put the ball in the hands at the end of a shot clock. And this year they don't have that. Daniel Dingles tried to be that guy. 
Shiz Austin's been that guy at times. Obi was that, that guy at the beginning of the season. But at this point in the season where um, Obi's really in a – we can talk about him later, but he's in a funk. Um, Shiz is just – he's good, but he's not at that place yet in his career. I think he'll be there next year or the year after. And I think he'll be a really good guard, but I don't think he's there just yet. And I think Daniel Dingle just forces up a lot of bad shots with the, the – just – I don't – he just forces up a lot of bad shots. And um, I don't think they have a guy that consistently cons- can consistently put the ball in the basket. And you look at when they did was when Shiz was playing well, when Obi was playing well at the beginning of the year. Those, they, had, they had those go-to guys, and they played – they won games. They played, they played extremely well. And, and the moments were – and I think that's – you also see the – Sometimes the problems of Fran Dunphy's offense, I think it's reliant sometimes a little bit on a guy that can create his own shot and get a bucket when they need one. And this year they haven't been able to do that, and I think that's why they've struggled recently. What do you think? Oh, yeah, I, you know, I agree. I think that, you know, they don't have that player. They don't have the Quentin Nicosi, the Khalif Wyatt, or uh, Will Cummings. But I do think that. Uh, Dan, uh, Daniel Daniel has stepped up this year. You know, this year has by far been his best statistical year. Um, all he's his points per game, his, uh, points, per, his points per game, his rebounds per game, his assists per game. All across the board, he's been better this year. He's in a lot better shape. And, you know, maybe that's maybe the role that they have him in currently is just not, you know, the best fit for him. Maybe that, maybe Shiz should be the go-to guy. And, you know, I, I don't think that all of the – yeah, of course you have a guy at the end of the game that you would preferably like the ball, the ball, the hands to be in. You hope that you have one player who can take that last shot. But, you know, if they somehow can have Austin, Dingle, and Echinonia, just whoever has the hot hand, hand of that game to take that shot, maybe that'll be the best thing for them this year. Well, I think the closest guy that they have to a go-to legit guy is, is Quentin Rose, to be honest. Like, I think he has, not at this point in his career, I don't think he's, at the point at that point in his career, but that like he's the closest he'll be there I think at some point. I mean, but you look at you look at Shiz and I and I think he's played well, but um, I mean if you look at like his last five games for instance, he shot 37 percent from the field against USF, 26 percent against SMU, 45 okay that's good against Memphis, 30 percent against ECU ECU and 31 percent against UConn and it's just kind of I feel like that's representative of how he's played a lot of the season. He just he takes a lot of shots, and there are a lot of tough shots. Um, you know, you don't really see him trying to attack the basket very much. It's a lot of pull-up jumpers, um, and a lot of pull-up threes, and and I just don't think he hits him consistently enough to be a go-to guy at this point. Um, he's shooting six threes a game, shooting 33%, and and I like he's shooting the ball with confidence now, which is I really like, and it's paid off, but. Uh, but he's I don't think he's at the point where he can be a go to guy and I think that's what's hurt this team. You know, same old Quentin Rose, he has had a really good season. Um he's had he did hit a bit of a wall in January and then in February, but he bounced back and he started to play really well. Uh he scored a career his best game this year, he scored a career high, twenty six points, and that was uh over Florida State in early November. But I, I do agree with you with Rose being that go-to scorer, maybe not this year, but, you know, and uh, ahead in the future. I just think that with the Temple team, you know, the biggest thing is going to have to come down to, what, you know, what we've been talking about is just, you know, coming together at the end of the games. Um, I know before Adams hit that game winner, they, they were up. They, you know, they went into the timeout ahead in the game. So it's not that they're not in the game. They're just not, they're not finishing off the game. Yeah, and I think that's part of the reason why, because they don't have a go-to guy then that shot clock. And, and, and Fran Duffy's offense is how really relying on that, I, I think, a lot. And that, sometimes they don't have a lot of flow to it, but they've been bailed out because of guys like Khalif Wyatt and Quentin DeCozy who can score regardless. And this year it's just not working. And I think it needs to be a little more disciplined with this team, um, allowing for more. Um, a la- uh, so there's less poor shots, poor shots, Larson. Um, and Alani Moore is another guy who you've seen flashes of. But, uh, you know, I saw uh, the game yesterday, Sunday, against UConn. The people who really stood out were Ernest Aflaxi and uh, – 
Damian Moore, two guys that hadn't been producing a lot, but just they brought energy. Um, well, especially Ernest brought a lot of energy off the bench, and the stat book won't show show it, and it really won't. You really wouldn't have noticed unless you watched him closely. But he just fought and he played hard, and you can tell he wants it. And Damian Moore showed that he can shoot, hit uh, three, three I think mid range jumpers, finishes eleven points, had an N one dunk over someone, and he played really well too. And if they can get uh, interior scoring, um, I think that'd be really helpful. It hasn't been a Temple team. And as far as I can remember, that didn't have an interior scoring presence. Um, a, a successful team that didn't have an interior support, scoring presence. I think it's very imperative for a Temple team to have an inside um, scoring presence. And Damian Moore brings that, and he showed that on Sunday. Now, one of the re- another reason for their you know, lack of cohesion at the end of games has to be due to Josh Brown being out. No, oh, without a doubt. I mean, uh, Josh Brown, he, you know, he played the, he missed the first six games, and then he played the next five, and he hasn't played since the Villanova game early December. And it's just his experience, his, his motor, his defensive game, his ability to run the offense. His ability to run the offense. I mean, you can't replace, you can't make up for having a point guard. Yeah, without a doubt. And um, and it's more than likely he's probably going to take a medical red shirt here. I think that would make the most sense. Yeah, um, especially with where they're at right now at this part of the season. But yeah, and and, and do you have anything else to add about Temple? Um, it would just be I think you know their success as far as this season was going to come down to you know winning close games. Yeah, and I I think they're a scary team to face in the in the AAC tournament. I don't. I mean, they got a lot of talent. I, I really think that I think they have pieces. It's just a matter if a guy like Shiz can hit shots and a guy Obi can get some confidence back and Daniel Dingle can be a little more disciplined. And I think um if they're able to do those things they're a pretty good team. They're scary and we saw that earlier in the season. They have their ceiling is high, but their baseline ground level is low. It's very low. They could be really bad or really good. And I could see them making a run or I could see them getting blown out in the first round. But why don't we transition on to LaSalle? Um, LaSalle's been another kind of disappointment this year. I think everyone expected a lot um, with these three transfers coming in um, from pretty big schools, B.J. Johnson from Syracuse, Demetrius Henry from South Carolina, and Pookie Powell from Memphis. Everyone had um, some big expectations for this year. They were supposed to be an NCAA run kind of year. Especially with also returning guys from last year, like Cleon Roberts, who has been a starter for the last three, two or three years, and Jordan Price, who's been fantastic in his time at LaSalle scoring the basketball, and Tony Washington, who stepped up last year, um, along with Mark Stukes and Johnny Schuler. This was supposed to be a year that that John Giannini would get back to the NCAA tournament, hopefully win a couple games, and they just haven't uh, done that. Um, do you want to talk about why? You know, you know, kind of. I'll start off by saying, you know, we sat in those press conferences last year and hearing Giannini say, and seeing him, you know, trouble to find words to try to explain what was going on last year. And you know, we knew that this year was going to be the year where they were going to step up and play well because they were adding three transfers, like you said. And you know, I think that they they played better than they did last year. You know, granted, they do have three transfers. But for some reason, the combination of Price and Johnson hasn't always meshed, or haven't always found ways to win games when it, you know, when it came down to it. I do think, you know, they're a really uh, impressive team. You know, they have so many different options. They have Ricky Powell at point, you know, he's missed uh, six games this year due to an uh, injury, and you know, Johnson maybe missed one game, but he's been spectacular. And you know, you would think that you, know, you have. We have Price, we have Johnson, and we also have Powell, we have Cleon Roberts. Do you think that would keep the Jordan Pace team win? Yeah, you would. And I think that um, you thought that they got it going there for a little bit where they won six out of seven games. Oh, wait. They won se- uh, seven not they won uh, seven out of eight games um, after the loss to Georgetown. They beat Florida Gulf Coast, Mercer in a, an exciting game, triple overtime. They lost a tough one to Dayton where they played 
you know, pretty well. Lost by 11. Dayton's the top team, uh, second to top team in the conference, or tied for first. And they beat St. Louis, Duquesne, um, a Rhode Island team that's 17 and nine. They beat George Washington, George Washington team that's 14 and 13. Had some good players. They beat a Davidson team that's 14 and 11 at this point. They have, you know, Josh Gibbs and some other, uh, some some you know, real. They're 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 not a team to look past. And I thought maybe they're going to get it together. And I think that they well they played a really good VCU team. They they got handled 90 to 52, and then they lost to Penn. And I think that's where things started to turn around for both sides. Um, things turned around for Penn. Things started to look bright right there. They just beat a really – they beat a good LaSalle team. And I think that's one of the lower moments probably LaSalle, LaSalle season, probably next to that Texas Southern loss that probably still stings today on that buzzer beater by Delaney Robinson. Um, and after that Penn loss, uh, they, they lost to St. Joe's. Um, they've only had three wins. They've gone uh, three and four after that. Um, and losing to some teams that they, you know, shouldn't be losing to. Uh, and they played some of the tougher competition, but um, they – LaSalle's expected to be one of the better teams. Um, and I think part of the reason why they haven't played well is uh, because of their defense, um, and this is something that was problematic last year as well. Um, opponents are shooting 47% from the field against LaSalle. That's 327th in the NCAA. They're, they're very, basically mean they're very bad, um, LaSalle. Uh, they've given up 39.5% from three. That's ranked thir- 342nd in the NCAA. And they're allowing 700, I mean, they're allowing 77.6 points per game, which is 293rd in the NCAA. They've had 10 games where they've given up 80 or more points, and in comparison, Nova's only given up one game with eight or more points. Um, and I think that's where they've really been hurt, not necessarily offensively, but what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, on the defensive end, like you were explaining with the stats, is they just haven't been able to stop teams. They haven't been able to stop any, anybody. And I know the one game that we went to against Texas Southern, Giannini joked around and said that one of the players was trying to uh, play like Kevin Durant against them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just think that, you know, offensively, we know B.J. Johnson and Jordan Price to put the ball in the basket. But what happens when the defense have been is, is brutal. They, you know, I think that they have holes in their defense. You know, Tony Washington is really uh, great last year on the board. But this year it seems like they're not, they're not able to stop other teams, which is, you know, force them to try to outscore teams. But when you try to do that, you're never going to try – you're never going to win games like that. You're going to have to, you know, play at both of the end. So – I think with them, you know, they're going to, you know, you, you know what we're going to get from Johnson and Price and even um, Roberts and sometimes Amar Stoops, but I think it's going to come down to how all those guys come together and play team defense. Yeah, and you see moments of flashing of good defense. Like you see against um, when they played, you know, there, there have been moments where the d- the defense has come together and that they have um, – that they played better, you've seen improvements. Um, one specific game was against Drexel. I understand Drexel is not the best, but um, you know Tony Washington, uh, uh, Yevgen Sakniuk, and Demetrius Henry, and the other big man B.J. Johnson who helped out for a little bit. They held um, Rodney Williams, who's averaging 16 points a game. We talked about him earlier. He they held him to seven points, made him foul out four turnovers, one of four from the field. Um, and that's like an example of a really good game. Where, but then they take a step back, and um, will play poorly against another team. And it's just, and I and I don't think it is offense. I think that they've, you know, they're averaging uh, 77 points per game. Um, they're they're not playing poorly offensively, and they're, you know, they're shooting they're shooting 46 percent from the field. Um, they're shooting 37% from three, 77% from the line, which is 10th in the NCAA. I mean, that, those are pretty good offensive stats. So it's really all on defense. Rebounding, too. I mean, you talked about it earlier. They have 810 total rebounds on the year, which is 181st in the NCAA, oh, which is 338th in the NCAA. And they've given up 592 rebounds, which is 28th 
in the NCAA. Uh, and you can just see, like, they're just not getting enough rebounds. And, um, and they, 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 you can see that it's, I think it's more defensive focused than anything. No, I agree. And, you know, that's not something that you want to, that's not something you want them to, you know, uh, struggle in, you know, especially heading down the stretch, going into conference play and we're trying to fight for a NCAA tournament, dude. Yeah, and what do you think about, um, I mean, what, what positives can you take so far? I think the positives have to be the transfers. Um, what B.J. Johnson has been able to do this year is incredible. Yeah, you know, I was looking really at his stats. He's really good. You know, at Syracuse, he didn't have the opportunity to stand out like he's doing now at foul, but, I mean, he's putting in he's putting in work. He's, he's great on the offensive end. He's, you know, been able to, you know, last year, they relied a lot on Jordan Price and his scoring, but this year, now they have Johnson, who's kind of like, you know, he's the lead guy now. Price is his scoring has dropped, and uh, I noticed uh, Price is shooting a lot, a uh, few baskets than he did last year, which I think is, has helped his average. So I think the uh, addition of Johnson has really helped their offensive game. And then Pookie Bow, I know for a stretch there, he had missed six games because of an injury. And that, that really hurts him because he has to have other guards to play the play point guard, but he was he was a guy, so he took that away. And he and Amy had said that, you know, the injury that Johnson had suffered was, uh, you know, was mild, so he was able to come back right away. And with Powell, he had missed two to three weeks. So, you know, he missed two to three weeks, which, which meant that he was missing practice. So he had to get back in shape, and that was put him back another week. So by the time he got that, you know, they had missed him for almost four to five games during conference play, which really hurts him. So I think transfers, transfers have, have helped. And, you know, with Powell playing, they're better off. Yeah, and I think that uh, I think Amar Stukes has played well though. I think he's one of the bright spots. I mean, the junior is is averaging eight point five points per game. He's shooting fifty three percent from the field, one point three steals. Um, I thought he's played very well offensively, uh, much better than I think most would have anticipated. And I think a lot of people thought he would have got buried on this team, um, and maybe would have lost minutes to some of the freshmen or even Johnny Schuler. Um, just based off how poorly he had played with so many minutes the last couple of years, but he's really thrived this year. And again, it's not defense; it's not offense that's hurt them. They played well offensively. Um, these high, the high ball screens with Price and and Johnson have worked. Um, they're scoring, and and but there's also like you go to a Drexel game and you notice just how hard they're playing. You don't go to a Sal game and like that's the first thing you notice. They don't look like they're they're not very cohesive, um, and they're not. They're not busting their tails like um, Drexel is. Um, and you don't notice that same energy. It seems kind of tense, like that there are a lot of these expectations and that they don't – and that it, it's like they're not they're not just playing. It's like they're, they're worried about the expectations. And I just don't think that they're playing as cohesive and as hard as, as they should be. And they are an older team, so, you know, the, set, the uh, expectations are going to be there. And I think it's a little bit different in Drexel because they're a lot younger. And I wouldn't say that LaSalle's not as hungry, but they're, they're older players. So I think that they're, like you were saying, more worried about, you know, this being kind of like their second or last year playing. So I guess they're just, like you said, playing a little tense and not playing as free as a team like Drexel who has a lot of younger players playing. Yeah, well, they need to bring more energy, and I think that would help a lot. But, yeah. Um, so now, you know, let's talk a little about Villanova. We'll save the best for last. And, uh, I mean, there's not much to say about Villanova that isn't said a lot. I mean, they're a fantastic defensive team. They play so well together. Um, they, I mean, they've proven themselves to be one of the best teams in the nation, obviously, by winning last year. But again, this year, they've just, they're, they're so well coached and they're so disciplined offensively and defensively. And they probably have the best player in the country in Josh Hart. But with that said, how how do you beat Villanova, Will? Um, and do they have the depth again to repeat? I don't think you beat Villanova. I think that they beat themselves to be completely honest with you. Um, with Villanova, as they showed last year, I mean, their problem, and I think this has been a problem uh, Gay Wright has had since he took over Villanova, is that they've never really had depth in the front court. Typically, they'll have, you know, one big man, and then they'll have four guards around. So then everyone's pace is, oh, you know, 
once they come up against a team like last year, the North Carolina, they'll struggle because they don't have the size. But they proved to us last year that size does not matter uh, when it comes to, you know, winning championships. So for a team to beat Villanova, I I think that they were just having to get really lucky and Villanova would have to have one of the worst shooting nights they've had in a really long time. So one trip tonight, I think, you know, we can both agree on it. They, they rely a lot on making shots, three-pointers, um, a lot of jump shots. So if a team were able to, you know, play tight defense around the perimeter on them and force them to play through the post, I think that's one way to not beat them but to limit their scoring that game. Yeah, and I, and I think that, um, you know, you see my, my, Michael Bridges a lot covering the four. And it, I mean, you look back and I, the first team that I think of is a team that would that would – uh, threaten them is North Carolina, and they beat North Carolina. I mean, North Carolina last year had Bryce Johnson, Kennedy Meeks, Isaiah Hicks, Joel James, all gigantic. Every single one of them is is huge and would be the five easily on any team, and they're all on the same team. Um, and Villanova beat them, and they're just so well coached, and they play so hard. Like you talk about, like a you know, LaSalle, we just talked about LaSalle. Like, Villanova, you know, they don't ever not play hard. Yeah, I, mean, I would agree. It, it, you know, it comes down to Jay Wright. He has, you know, when Villanova plays, you know, they are a well-oiled machine, but they are they're business-like. They come into the games and, you know, they may blow out a team or it may be a tight game. But every time that something happens, you know, either they get upset or they do what they normally do and win, the camera will pan to Jay Wright, and he, he stole it. He, he expects his team to win, and when things don't go his way, he's not going to, you know, have an outburst or, you know, go crazy about it. He's going to, you know, accept it, shake the other coach's hand, and go back and get ready for the next game. So I think that he sets the tone for this team. That is the, the, what we see on the court is that's the mentality of their coach. And I know usually a team is what their coach is, but Villanova personifies that they are their coach. They, they never seem like they're uh, out of control. They seem like they're in every game. They they have a style that works for them. And, you know, you would think that losing Ochefu and RGB Acuna you know, would put them behind, but they haven't missed a the beat. They, they lost two close games in the in conference play. And besides that, they've been – he just carried on from the national championship. Yeah, Jalen Brunson has been really good, uh, especially as of recently. Um, he, I mean, he's a point guard shooting 40, 54% from the field. And I think that says a lot about the team's efficiency and the fact that they take good shots, and they're just really good. And, I mean, I, I know we shouldn't be thinking about um, looking forward to the NBA draft, but I, I don't know why a team would pass up on Josh Hart. I don't care where you're drafting. This guy is – he's athletic – he can shoot, he can drive, he can play defense. He, I just don't see where you go wrong with him and a guy like him. And, and they're just – Josh Hart is legit the best player in the country. He does everything great. Like there isn't an aspect of his game that's um, – that is like – that he struggles with. And um, y- you also look at – you know, you worry about also sometimes like these past couple of years with depth with these Villanova teams, um, and the fact that like especially without Phil Booth, you know, who you know what options uh, do they do they like, you know, who's their backup point guard at this point is is probably Don, Dante DiVincenzo, right? DiVincenzo. Yes, Dante. Oh my goodness, Dante has played. You know, I was reading something, and they were saying that, you know, Jay Wright, we knew, he knew that Dante would, you know, be a good player. Dante, unfortunately, missed last year's season due to a foot injury and was unable to participate in, you know, their conference, in their NCAA tournament run. But this year, I think he's making up for a lot of time. He, you know, somehow he, I think Jay Wright was quoted as saying that he's uh, Michael Jordan of Delaware. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Dante has had a really good season. He had a turn high against Trey Young, where he was 10 from 11. He seemed to be a winning shot against Virginia in a really mm-hmm. close and uh, contested battle. And I don't know, we, you know, we look, the one pitfall of the season, like you were saying, what is, is Bill Booth. But Dante has taken, I would say he's replaced Booth, who is only right and going over a guard who can handle the rock and also attack the basket when necessary. 
Yeah, and, and I think that um, I mean Dante can jump. Oh my God, he's very athletic, and it's more athletic than a lot of the other teams that we've seen with Michael Bridges, Josh Hart, um, and and Dante, and and even even a guy like uh, Jalen Brunson isn't athletically necessarily vertically, but he's just an athlete. Like he's acrobatic, um, he's strong, he's quick, and um. I worry sometimes about their depth and about how deep they can go into the bench um, and about, like, where, you know, if they, you know, God forbid if they have another injury, but, you know, what, uh, like, the, they, I worry about their depth. Um, I don't know if you worry about that. Like, their overall depth, not just front court. Well, not just front court, but, you know, of course, I think the one thing I have is, one thing I will bring up is the front court with Dale Reynolds. I think for the past three games, he's been a rip, rip injury. So I think that's something that we're going to think have to be concerned about because he's their lone big man. I know they have Philip Dylan Painter and they have some other players, Tim uh, other front court. Tim Delaney, but with Tim Delaney, he, he doesn't have the experience of someone who was senior like Dale Reynolds has. So I don't know if Jay Wright would be. I don't think he would put Tim Delaney in there. I think he would either put Bridges or either someone we haven't talked about yet is Pascal. I think yeah. he could put, maybe play the five. Uh, we'll get to Pascal in a second. But I think that, you know, after you get past um, the starting five with Chris Jenkins, Josh Hart, um, Reynolds when he's healthy, uh, Bridges, and Brunson, you have Pascal coming off the bench and, you know, Dante uh, sometimes starts, sometimes comes off the bench. And I think that is something you have to worry about is the lack of depth. Um, one game in the NCAA tournament, what happens when someone gets in the foul trouble? Who, who can uh, Jay Wright call them? Because really, they're only eight to nine players deep. They're even, they're even uh, uh, fewer players to call on than they were last year. And last year was a surprise. So I think that's something that you know may hurt them. Um, of course, they're the favorites right now to you know, them or Gonzaga to win the national championship or at least to be the number one seed going into the tournament. So I think, you know, only time will tell, but, you know, definitely something that it's always been a problem with uh, Villanova. So what they did, if last year's any indication, maybe <laughs> Jay Wright will find a way to make it work. Yeah, and I hope so. It does a fun run last year. and um, We'll be keeping up with uh, Villanova and all these City Six teams over the next couple of weeks as they finish up their seasons, um, whether that be in the NCAA tournament and this, in the conference tournament, or even before that, and uh, we'll be, you know, uh, keeping them covered, and stay tuned at uh, www.thephilacollegebball.com, and um, we'll be uh, hopefully getting one more podcast out by the end of the season, or at the, or after the end of the season, and um, uh, make sure you comment in the, uh, in the comment section, um, tell us about um, what you think about what we have to say? Let's start the conversation with you. We're, we'd love to reply and uh, and uh, start the conversation and continue talking about these things because we love talking about City Six basketball. But um, thank you for listening. Um, I'm Benjamin Thomas. And I'm Warren Barry. All right. Thank you. Have a nice night.